came to realize that this is a, a view embraced all over the country. You know, that people will say things like, oh, you know, nobody really lives in DC or nobody's really from DC. Or, no, you, nobody stays in DC and all these kinds of comments. And, and I really feel like DC doesn't get the respect it deserves from the nation that it serves. It, it's, uh, it's the capital city, but people only like, you know, they'll, they'll come as tourists, they'll visit the monumental city, but they won't really take time to get to know the real city uh, that people actually live in. You know, I live in Maine now. People in Maine don't even realize that DC residents don't have the right to vote, right? And when I tell, when I tell them, they, they don't believe me. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute, that just doesn't make any sense. How can that be? And, and so uh, DC history, I think, is, is fascinating. I think, I think my DC history teacher was completely wrong. DC has a very rich history. It's a fascinating, fascinating history. And it's a history that Derek and I certainly think is important, not just for DC students to know or DC residents to know, but for Americans to know, right? Because while this is local history for DC residents, it's also national history because this is our nation's capital. Well, thank you so very much. And thank you very much for writing the book. I absolutely love it. Obviously, I'm, I keep coming back. I keep coming uh -huh. back more. So Good. you've done a great job. I want to keep right on into it. And I've got the next question that says, speak to the history of DC's enslaved people and why DC, specifically the 1862 Compensated Emancipation Act and how it all played in the history and the making of DC. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, and again, going along with this idea that people don't really know DC, many people don't even realize that DC was in the South and that DC was a slave city from the very beginning. In fact, the whole reason why it's in D you know, why DC is where it is on the banks of the Potomac rather than the banks of the Susquehanna or in Philadelphia or New York has everything to do with, with slavery and with the, the presence of, of enslaved people. Um, you know, if you, if you take a, a tour, people will often joke, the tour guide will say, oh, you know, DC was built on a swamp. Of course, you people say, drain the swamp and all this business. Um, the truth of the matter is that DC was not a swamp. Certainly the, the area that, that George Washington selected, George Washington selected for the, the federal city was prime plantation country. It was tobacco fields and corn fields. And, and this was already cleared it was inhabited by, by hundreds of enslaved people uh, on plantations dotting the, the area. And, and so the Southerners, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, others who were involved in these negotiations with Alexander Hamilton and others, they wanted to put the federal city in the South, not in a co cosmopolitan area, not in the North, not where there was Already, even in the 1780s and, and early 1790s, there was already a growing anti-slavery movement that had, that had roots even in Europe. And so they wanted to make sure that it was safely ensconced within the South, that it was put in plantation country where it would not have all these corrupting influences. Um, or, or as James Madison put it, he was afraid when he took his enslaved people to Philadelphia and other places, he was afraid they would be tainted. Uh, by the free black population in those places. So the fact that DC is where it is has everything to do with the black population. And in fact, that's part of why we call the book Chocolate City, uh, because we believe that, that race and the presence of a large black population is, is the, the central animating feature of, of the city's history. And we have to understand that the, the role that race has always played in DC history. It's affected, <clears throat> Whether or not DC citizens get the right to vote, it affects where they live, where they work, who they interact with, the kind of jobs they can get, <clears throat> and everything else. And so, again, that's another way that DC is, is somewhat of a microcosm for the, the larger national struggle with, with race. But what's interesting about DC is that, <clears throat> although it wasn't an enslaved city, it was also from the very beginning, it started urbanizing because it was a government city. So people would move, it, was, it very quickly, started to shift toward a, a more urban-based population. And so the proportion of, of enslaved Black people started to, to go down as the proportion of, the, of free Black people went up. And by 1830, the majority of Black Washingtonians were actually free. And these free Black people established churches, built schools, 
uh, created community benevolent organizations, kind of like insurance companies, but just within the community. Uh, and they created these institutions that were very, very important for black life and, and, and uh, success in the city. Uh, and they were also in some ways kind of beacons of opportunity uh, for, for other enslaved people on surround, in surrounding areas. You know, there are all these great ads uh, from, from these planters who are, who are at their wits end because their enslaved people keep running away. They would, they would use the word absconding. They've absconded um, and they think they are lurking in Washington because enslaved people saw Washington as, as a, a beacon of, of freedom within this, the, the, the slave South. So if you're an enslaved person in, Washington, in Virginia or Maryland or North Carolina, you may not be able to make it to, to Pennsylvania or New York, but you might be able to make it in DC. And there was enough of a community there that they might be able to, to help you, protect you, and, and give, you, give you work and so forth. And so uh, DC has a thriving anti-slavery community led by the free black population. It has a thriving underground railroad uh, during the, in the 1840s. It has thriving black institutions. And even, there are even black Washingtonians who challenge uh, the, the legal system in, around them. Um, and so they're filing freedom suits. Sometimes you have enslaved people filing freedom su suits for their, for their manumission. There are black businessmen like uh, Isaac Carey who files suit against black codes pre preventing black businesses. And they win, they sometimes win. And so even within the, the, the structure of slavery that was so restrictive, black people were able to, to find ways to assert themselves and, and to sometimes win their freedom or to make the most of whatever freedom they had. Um, of course, come 1862, <clears throat> DC's enslaved population becomes the first freed in the country. It's the only compensated emancipation in, uh, in American history, and it happens more than eight months before the Emancipation Proclamation. And so many generations afterward in, in DC, many black people proudly carried that designation of being the first freed, right? We were the first in the, in the country to be, to be emancipated from slavery. <clears throat> and during the Civil War, DC is the, the capital of the Union Army, right? And so it grows exponentially as, as all these soldiers are coming in to, to train. You've got war workers coming in. Uh, and you also have fugitive slaves who see this as an opportunity. And one of the things that's really interesting is the role that, that enslaved people play in pushing Abraham Lincoln to the Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was you know, famously said, look, if I could save the Union without freeing a slave, I would. Um, because that was his top priority in the Civil War, was to, to maintain the Union. Right. And it was really enslaved people running a, away from their plantations, following the Union Army, turning up uh, you know, at, at all those Civil War defenses, right? You know, they're turning up at, at Fort DuPont. They're turning up at Fort Reno. They're camping outside. They're trying to get as close to that flag as they could because they knew that this war was going to be about freedom, even before Abraham Lincoln knew it. <laughs> right, they were pushing it, and they and they helped make that happen. So the, you touched on the contraband and the whole contraband camps. We'll go there a little bit later. Let's okay. get right into. I know the question that a lot of people have been asking, um, as re, as relates to the, this whole series and around the series that we're talking about, and and Jeannie talked about earlier, and that was, can you speak to the history of Rock Creek Park serving as a dividing line in mm -hmm. D.C. So specifically right here in many of your neighborhoods, your backyards, Chris is going to address that this evening. Sure. You know, it's, it's interesting that that happens really in the, in the mid to late 20th century. And I'll get to that, but tell a funny story uh, that, so after college, I went and I, I went down to rural Mississippi and taught, uh, taught school there and actually lived for a time in Marion Barry's home place. It, it had been in Mississippi, right? In the middle of the Mississippi Delta. And I taught in this little town called Sunflower. And my, my students, the, the first day, they were walking me around town, and, and they, they, we walked to the, the downtown. This is a population 750 people, uh, so it's a small town. And right through downtown is, a, is this grassy median, this grassy strip that runs uh, the length of downtown. They, and it's where the railroad used to run. The railroad didn't run anymore. It was all overgrown. It's just this gra green area. And the kids said, well, that on the other side, that's the white folks' park. This is the black folks' park. We don't go over there. 
and they don't come over here. And you know, just kind of let me know what the, what the rules were. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'm from DC. In DC, we call that Rock Creek Park. Uh, because the DC that I grew up in, Rock Creek Park really had that same kind of function, was dividing the, the wealthier white population from a, a poorer black population, and, and often a middle class black population too on the other side of the park. Um, what's interesting is that, that it was not always that way. You know, when I was growing up, I was like, oh yeah, that's just the way it is, and that's just the way it's always been in DC, right? You know, Anacostia and all that area, that, those are just the black parts of DC, and Ward three is the white part. But that, that wasn't true for much of DC history. You know, the antebellum city, you know, before the, the Civil War was very much a walking city. So obviously it's much smaller than the city is now. Everything was, Florida Avenue was called Boundary Street. And so that was the boundary between Washington City and what was called Washington County, which was all farmland pretty much. Um, and the, the Washington City was integrated. I mean, you look at city directories and it's really interesting to see you, you have rich people right next to poor people who live next to, to black people. You know, so you might have a, a, a black domestic work, woman living next to uh, a wealthy white businessman. And that's, that's kind of the way it, it was. Um, and of course, if they were enslaved people, they lived right in the white households as well. And so it was very much an, an integrated residential city. And DC doesn't start to segregate geographically until the late 19th century with the development of uh, what came to be known as streetcar suburbs. As streetcars were developed and streetcar lines started to, to radiate outward from the, from the city, developers quickly realized that there was profit to be made in creating exclusive, exclusive neighborhoods like Chevy Chase or Calorama that were accessible by street, streetcar but only accessible to people who could afford it. Uh, and so that's where you, see to, you start to see the, the racial spacing of DC neighborhoods. And then in the early 20th century, in the 20s and 30s and 40s primarily, um, after a Supreme Court decision in, uh, that, that was based in DC, Corrigan v. Buckley in 1926, the Supreme Court gave its okay basically to restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants were basically deeds that homeowners would, would sign, would, you know, they would put in the deed that they, were, they would not allow their house to be sold to uh, African-Americans or Jews or Persians. You, you should look at some of these, let's say they've, they've got all these different names that we, we don't use anymore. All these different kinds of people that they didn't want in their neighborhood. Um, and restrictive covenants pro proliferate, you know, across Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, all these, these uh, suburbs, what were, what were suburbs that were expanding at the time. And that allowed white Washingtonians to put some physical space uh, between themselves and, and the black population. But that's still not on the, the west side of the park, right? And so even into the 1940s, you have lots of white people who were still the majority of the population living all over the city. In 1950, Anacostia is still more than 80% white. It's largely rural uh, in 1950. And what, what really accelerates the change is uh, well, a couple of things. One is suburbanization, uh, which is federally financed. And you know, the federal government, you, you, you think about sort of the classic American history telling of the 1950s, it's all about the suburbs and the white picket fence and all of this stuff. Well, that's largely accessible only to white people mm -hmm. because federal loan programs uh, are set up so that they don't provide loans for integrated neighborhoods. And the presence of one black family can turn a, safe, a neighborhood from being a, a safe area for loans into uh, you know, a hazardous area and, and have it lined with red. That's why we, they, were, they, were mark, they were marked on the maps in red, and so it was called redlining. And so during this era of massive federally financed suburbanization, where, where the federal government is really paying people largely to move to the suburbs, black people are shut out, right? Because Montgomery County, Fairfax County, they're, they're segregated. Um, in fact, they're more segregated in the 1950s than they are in the 1850s or, or even 1900. Montgomery County uh, in 1900 is, is more than 20% black. By the 1950s, it's five, 6% black, right? Be, and part of that is because Washington, white Washingtonians are moving out to the suburbs and white 
migrants are coming in. They're coming in because the federal government is expanding. This, this, is the, this is the beginning of the Cold War. Pentagon has been built in Northern Virginia. These white migrants are, are coming in by the tens of thousands, but they are not going into the city. They're going to the suburbs, right? So the, the suburbs grow dramatically and they grow almost entirely with white migrants. Black Washingtonians are, are hemmed in by these restrictive covenants that are in place, not only in DC, but, uh, but in the surrounding suburbs. Uh, some people called it a, 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 white, a white ring, others called it a white noose around the city, making it really difficult in the, in the 40s, 50s, and, and 60s to, to move out into the suburbs. And so what happens is DC really spaces out spatially. Um, and so black people move more, you know, further northward into, into Mount Pleasant or Columbia Heights. And as they do, white people move into, into the neighborhoods of Ward 3. And so Rock Creek Park really does have this this dividing line effect, you know, where where the, the west side is the white side, and everything to the east uh, becomes becomes blacker and poorer as as you move to the '60s, to the '70s, to the, to the '80s. So the questions are coming in fast and free, but I have a few more, and I think that they're going to um, address a number of questions that are even already in the in the um, chat box. Mm -hmm. So in the book that you co-author, you speak to the rim of Washington is knocked off. The rim of Washington is knocked off. And you speak of developers such as Senator Newlands. Can you share your thoughts on the early history of Newlands and redlining? We kind of talked a little about it a little, but making DC the segregated or exclusive DC. So those communities like Georgetown and, mm -hmm. and, and Logan Circle and different places of that um, uptown. So speak to that, Chris. I'd love to. Sure. So, so that quote comes from the in the, in the 1890s where. Um, developers are, are really realizing the potential of what used to be called Washington County, right? All these kind of rural areas that because of streetcars, because of the, the, the technological revolution of streetcars are now accessible. So people can live in a Tenley town or, or a Chevy Chase and still come in to, to work uh, downtown. And so that's what they say, the rim is blown up, right? Boundary Street is a boundary no more. It's just gonna become Florida right. Avenue and we've got all these other developments. Um, and Senator Newlands was not the only senator. There were, there were a number of senators, uh, from, especially from the West, who came in very wealthy. And they, they look at this, uh, this city and they think, oh, there's, there's profit to be made here in, in real estate speculation, right? And so Senator Newlands um, has a plan to create what in his mind was the, the, the you know, an idealist, a, a, a country idol. Right, uh, like this, this, this beautiful, uh, exclusive neighborhood on the, on the far reaches of D.C. and in Montgomery County, and he helps finance the, the construction of Chevy Chase Lake out out in in southern Montgomery County, um, and and goes right along the streetcar. He you know, encourages the streetcar line to go right up out uh, Connecticut Avenue, and he starts surreptitiously buying up acres all along the the streetcar lines, with the idea of developing what he called Chevy Chase. Uh, and from the beginning, it was intended to be exclusive. Uh, and he, all the brochures and all, all of his comments, he, he talked about keeping undesirables out. Um, and undesirables meant poor people, sure, uh, but it also meant black people. And, and so, you know, it was segregated from the beginning. Uh, it was intended to be segregated. I mean, that's where the profit was, uh, was, was in its exclusivity, in its segregation. And we see this in Lee Droid Park, right? You know, that was started as an exclusive white suburb, you know, with, with gates around and, and everything. And they fought very hard for the first two decades to keep it segregated. Um, you know, so we see developers realizing the profit. And then Tenley Town is a great example in Fort Reno, where by, by the early 20th century, 1910, 1920, 1930, developers are, are, are salivating over that land. Right, because because now they're talking. What used to be the boondocks is now close enough in. It's got fresh country air. They would talk about um, the problem was it, it, there was a black community already there that had been living there since the Civil War, um, and so basically the federal government just exercises eminent domain and and pushes those those people out, destroys the the community of Fort Reno, um, and in order to build Woodrow Wilson High School, Alice, you know, my alma maters. Um, and, and create green space for, for what they hoped would be a, a burgeoning white community and what has become a burgeoning white community. 
Uh, Georgetown was a little bit different because it, it already existed. You know, Georgetown predated DC. You know, Georgetown, Maryland already existed even before DC. It was a, you know, a tobacco, um, you know, it was a tobacco port. Uh, and as a tobacco port, like many port cities, it was kind of a, a, a gritty part of town. You know, lot, lots of, you know, low income dock workers and sailors. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a rough part of town, lots of alley dwellings. Um, yet, you know, even through the turn of the 20th century, it was, it was not seen as a, as a particularly desirable place to live. Um, but that starts to change in the 20s and 30s as you get more young white professionals who want to live closer to the city. You know, they, they, they want to live even within walking distance or, or you know, a, a short way from, uh, from where they're working, particularly when new dealers come in, you get this massive in influx of these young idealistic new dealers. They want to live close to town, but they don't want to pay a ton of money. Well, Georgetown has lots of uh, relatively cheap housing, and it also has what was called then revitalization. Um, you know, now we might call it gentrification, but at that time it was called revitalization. And these were homeowners who sought to revitalize their communities by fixing their properties up, trying to boost real estate values, trying to, trying to clear out alley housing and, and so forth. And they're largely successful. And Georgetown becomes in some ways a template mm -hmm. for other neighborhoods where, where developers look at what happens to Georgetown over the course of 20 years or so between the 1920s and the 1940s. They look at what's happened to real estate values. And you know, by the 1950s, Senator John Kennedy buys a house there, right? And, then, and that's where he starts his inauguration march from his house in Georgia, right? It, it's become the most fashionable place in the, in the city. Developers look at that and say, wow, we should do that in other places, Foggy Bottom, Logan Circle, elsewhere, uh, and really kind of step up efforts to, to buy up older housing stock, clear out the, the families that, that live there, fix them up and, and rent out to, to white federal workers. Um, and, and so we see that process so, you know, it's different waves of, of what we now call gentrification that come over the city. This is not a 21st century phenomenon. I mean, this is, this is go, goes way back. So Chris, everybody's excited. The, the <laughs> chat box is brimming with questions. And I just have a few more because we want to make sure that we get to some of sure. those questions as well. But you and I have talked, we, we've had a lot of time to talk now. And so we've talked a, a, deal, a great deal about some of the things that are real, a bit, real interest to me and just interest because of the history around it. But the reconstruction era of the South, of mm -hmm. course, was far different from the reconstruction era here in the district. Expound on that a little bit for those who are on the call. I may not know that history because as you and I have said before, reconstruction is a part of history that we don't really talk a great deal about, but there was so much going on and so many things were happening right here in Washington, DC. Absolutely, no, DC was on the, on the forefront. Uh, you know, I'm actually reading right now, I just, open a book by one of my favorite historians, Eric Foner, who's, who wrote a book called The Second Founding about how you, know, you can't understand our modern constitution or modern America uh, if, you, if you just look at the founding year, you know, 1780s, right. and so he said the 1860s are where it's at, right? That's when modern America was founded because a lot of these questions about the constitution were, were, were being you know, fought over. And DC was at, right at the forefront. You know, that's the thing about DC is, is because it's the, the capital city, and it's under congressional control, you know, c Congress can do things in DC that it can't do elsewhere. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes this is good for DC, sometimes it's bad for DC, but it is what it is. Um, and so in the 1860s, radical Republicans, uh, who were very different back then than they are now, uh, and the, the radical Republicans see DC as an opportunity to create what, what uh, you know, the famous abolitionist Charles Sumner called an example for all the land, right? The, and Kate Mazur has got a fantastic book by, with that title, just about reconstruction in, in DC. And what the radical Republicans wanna do is, is they wanna show what reconstruction should look like across the South, and they do it here in DC. So after the war over in 1865, the very first bill, HR number one, um, that gets introduced that December, because that's when the, the next Congress convened. Right. In H.R. 1 was called the Negro Suffrage Act. It was about empowering black men in Washington to vote. Uh, and it passes, President Johnson vetoed it, it passes over his veto. And uh, 
black suffrage becomes a reality in DC, here before anywhere else. And so yeah. black voters start, start voting. Uh, and what do they do? Well, they, <laughs> they vote out the Georgetown mayor who was famously anti-black. Uh, anti uh, in 1868, they vote in uh, a white abolitionist, Sales Bowen, to, to take charge. And they hold them accountable. They say, look, now you're mayor. Uh, we, want, we want public positions, because that's what, that's what mayors did. You know, patronage is good politics, as Marion Barrio would say. Um, and he, he appoints about 30% of the appointments during the, the Bowen administration were black. It, the police force is integrated. The fire uh, department is, is integrated. Uh, you have black office holders from every ward in the city. Uh, you know, I, I tell the story in the book about a remarkable guy named George Hatton, who in 1862 is, is enslaved, right? And <laughs> he gets his freedom and, and within seven years, you know, he goes off and he joins the Union Army, fights in the war, gets wounded, comes back to DC, uh, becomes a labor leader, you know, is involved in, in strikes in the area, runs for office, becomes a city, you know, a city councilman by 1869. And so this time of Reconstruction is really this remarkable flowering of interracial democracy, biracial democracy that no one's ever seen before, right? And it's, it's, happening, it's happening in D.C. first, and it starts to happen elsewhere in the South as Southern states are, are, are you know, being required to uh, adopt the 14th Amendment and write their constitutions, but it's happening in D.C. And so what does this biracial city council do? Well, it starts to pass in, in anti-discrimination laws in 1869, 1872 barring dis racial discrimination in public places like restaurants and saloons, ice cream parlors. You should, the, the list is really kind of funny of all the places they felt were important enough to, to include. Ice cream parlors were, were very important. Um, but it's remarkable. And this was short-lived because there's a, there's a conservative counter-revolution that, that it, it is, is growing even as, as black office holders are, are, are being elected. Um, and it's kind of a two-step process. First, the DC is, is turned into a territory. So it loses its biracial city council, but it, it creates a house of delegates, but most of the power is put into the board of public works. Uh, and then three years later, all Washingtonians, white and black are stripped of the vote. And in place, Congress puts in a three person uh, commission, which in, in effect turns into a three white man commission that runs the city for the next century. Um, but for that brief time, it was, it was a remarkable place uh, to, to be. And those laws, what's interesting is those laws that are passed, those anti-discrimination laws, aren't repealed. Right. They're not enforced anymore by the late 19th century. They're not enforced in 1901 when they're recompiling the DC code, they're left out, but they're never repealed. And so when the post-World War II civil rights movement comes along, people start looking back at reconstruction they discover what they called the lost laws. And because these laws were lost, they were not enforced, but they were never repealed. So they bring them back and they use them as the basis, the legal basis for the, the post-World War II civil rights struggle in the city. So Re Reconstruction is a remarkable time. I think it's probably the least uh, well understood period of American history, but maybe the most important. At, we, we both agree on that. Give that title once again of that book on Reconstruction so that everyone yeah, would uh, example for all, or an example for all the land. Okay. Uh, by Kate we'll, put that, we'll put that in the chat box for those who are interested. Absolutely. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. So I only have time for one more question and then we're going to open up the floodgates. It's all facilitated. So no worries, Chris. I've got you. I'm, mm -hmm. I've got you. I want to speak um, lastly on the history of the development of city parkway. So we've got Rock Creek Parkway, Suitland Parkway, um, and, and on and on. And how the development disproportionately displaced low income and specifically people of color. Um, as we get ready for this DC and making DC more of a livable, commutable city, how did those, the building of these parkways impact and Rock Creek Park specifically? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, unfortunately it's an old story. You know, when, when things grow, you know, when progress comes, uh, it's usually on the backs of, of the poor and, and the black, it, certainly in this city, but, but elsewhere as well, because it's really a question of power and who has the power to, to dictate the terms on which development is going to happen. And by and large, the poor and the, the black do not have power uh, in this city. And, and you see this really uh, at the turn of the 20th century, 
with the creation of the, the Macmillan pan. So in the, in the 1890s, there was a, there was a whole movement um, called the City Beautiful movement, where it, it, was, it was kind of in response. It was a progressive era movement, the press, capital P Progressive Party, um, and progressives believed uh, they, were, they were trying to, to figure out a way to create more order uh, in, in what was a really a chaotic world. If you think about the late 19th century in American history, uh, there's a lot of urbanization, a lot of people moving from farms into cities, working in factories, living in, in crowded conditions. There's a lot of disease in the, in the city. Sanitation was not, not great. Um, and by the late 19th century, I mean, cities are really a really smelly, crowded, dirty places uh, that are that are not the best places to live in. And progressive era reformers say, "Oh, you know, we need to change this." And one of the one of the efforts was the city beautiful movement. Like, let's create beautiful cities that inspire awe in our uh, you know in, in in the residents and in, and in visitors. Uh, Daniel Burnham was the was the kind of the the leading philosopher of this idea. And he, he was part of the creation of what was, the, what was called the White City, nicknamed the White City at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Had a profound influence on landscape architects and city planners across the country. Uh, and City Beautiful uh, advocates focused on DC as kind of a great, a great place to try this out, right? To try to create this a monumental city that would that would inspire awe and and thereby lift up the the residents and 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 improve their behavior and and, and make you know our cities livable again. Um, and part of the reason that they chose D.C. is because it's not a democratic city, right? There's no local politics. You you didn't you didn't have to go before any voters to get this, these kinds of plans approved. All you had to do was work with three city commissioners in Congress, and they were. You know, they were 100% supportive of these kinds of efforts. You know, they they loved the developers, uh, and they 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 found a big champion in in Senator James McMillan of Michigan, who really came to love the city, moved here and came to love the city, and wanted to beautify, wanted to create you know what was called a, a capital worthy of the name, you know, worthy of the name Washington, right? So um, create a and they, they passed what was called the, the, the Macmillan Plan. They developed the Macmillan Plan, which transformed downtown DC uh, into what kind of what we know today, right? So be, there, there was always the White House and the, and the Capitol and the Washington Monument and so forth. Uh, but in between, there wasn't a mall. There, was, you know, there, was, there were railroad tracks crisscrossing the area. There were cows in the, in the fields there. I mean, it was, it was kind of a chaotic, you know, trees all over. And, the McMillan plan really said, look, we need to get rid of that. We need to have an orderly planned federal city with beautiful buildings that, that are imposing and awe-inspiring. And over the next several decades, that's precisely what they did. Um, and usually when that happens, they, somebody's got to move, right? And the people who have to move tend to be the poor people who live closest to those areas, the people in, in uh you know, the, the alleys, they wanted to get rid of the alleys, particularly in Southwest, uh, closest to the Capitol. Uh, the building of Union Station pretty much wiped out the, the white working class area of Swamp Boodle um, in, in order to construct a Union Station. And this was all part of an effort to beautify. And parkways were part of it, right? You wanted to, to give people in cars a chance to, uh, to drive along and, and enjoy the natural beauty. But that often means moving people out of the way. And so the Macmillan plan kind of becomes the basis for several decades worth of development that follows the same pattern, right? The creation of a, the monumental city uh, rather than, than a city where, where people can actually live. Um, you know, what's interesting about those plans, they don't mention the poor, poor people at all, except to say that they're going to need to move. Right, and and it's really remarkable, and you see this 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 process is replicated post World War II with with what was called the urban renewal movement, right, which was another effort to uh, to kind of revitalize the cities. People, businessmen were worried that all these shoppers were leaving the city, right. We talked about suburbanization that's happening at the time, right. So so people with money, white people generally, are moving out to the suburbs. The, the business owners want ways to bring them back in. So one idea was urban renewal, which was basically you level out the slums, you build nice housing 
in, in its stead and you, in the, and you create highways and, and uh, sort of arteries that will go out to those suburbs so they can bring shoppers in and send them back out when they're done. Uh, and that's precisely what they do. And they start by leveling 99% of the buildings in Southwest. They take the whole quadrant and they level it. There's 23,000 people there, mostly black, almost all low income. Uh, and they replace it with these high rise buildings, which at the time were very much in vogue, right? This was the vision of the city, it was high rise apartments, spaghetti like highways coming in and out. And again, they, they look at DC as a, as a great place to try these out because you don't have, have to worry about local politics. You don't have to worry about voters getting upset with you. Not much opposition. Yeah. And gumming up the works. You know, for developers, that's what they don't like. They don't want people gumming up the works. And that's what democracy does. And, you know, it gums up the works because people have a voice uh, in, in the process. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, my, my favorite, maybe I'll conclude with, with this if we want to open it, because I know we're, we got to get to the chat rooms and stuff. But, you know, my favorite story from the book is about, uh, about what happens after re urban renewal, right? So Southwest is devastated. Um, and activists in the community look at Southwest in horror and they say, you know, never again, right? We, we never want to see this happen again. And so when these same planners, right, at, like this wasn't just a one-time thing, right? And the urban renewal in Southwest was the beginning of a much larger process. And the, the planners had a grand scheme of, uh, for, for DC, which included an inner beltway along F Street, right, for downtown, and then the outer beltway, which did get built, and then these 10 lane arteries going out, right? And it was gonna be a city of highways. Uh, and this was, this was inevitable, it was a done deal. This, the money was appropriated, Congress was a big fan, the Washington Post and the Star, they loved this idea because it was a way to bring shoppers back and re you know, bring tax, you know, tax money back into the city and expand the tax base. Um, it was, you know, the corporations obviously loved it. They got these big contracts to make these massive uh, developments, these massive highways. And it was basically a done deal by the early 1960s. But, you know, and of course there was no, you know, there's no political opposition because the three commissioners are all on board except they didn't realize that there, there were people in DC who were, who were not gonna put up with that. And, and I tell the story in the book about the, uh, a group with a terrible acronym, the ECTC, the Emergency Committee on the Transportation Crisis, led by a, uh, a little guy named Sammy Abbott, uh, the, the, the son of Lebanese immigrants. And he, he, he joins forces with this young black fella named Reginald Booker. Uh, and the two of them create this remarkable movement that even though they have no vote, even though they have no levers of power, they are able over time through protests, through, through you know, chaining themselves to bulldozers by, you know, they would go, they had what were called unboarding parties. The city would come in and condemn some houses that were in the way of, of the planned highway. And Reginald Booker would come in with a crowbar and he'd tear those, those ply, that plywood off and he'd sweep it up and he'd move a family back in, right? And then they'd have a you know, block party for, for the family, right? They would do crazy things. And, uh, the famous black columnist, William Raspberry from the Post, he said, Reginald Booker and Sammy Abbott are crazy, but it's, but it's the only thing that's gonna stop these, these people from wrecking our city. And so what was inevitable in 1964 becomes impossible by 1972, they're filing lawsuits and they're winning, right? Because they do have the law on their side, including some of these laws from the 1860s that say you can't do this without approval from the city, the, the people of the city. And they win over and over and over again. And, and even finally, you know, Representative Natcher, who was the head of the uh, House District Committee for, for a tower, that transportation committee, he held up all this money that was supposed to go to build public transportation, the subway, he held up all that money because he, he would held it up until the highways were built. And even he finally caved in by the 19, early 1970s so we could get the money to build the metro instead of building all these crazy highways. And so again, what was inevitable in 1964 becomes impossible by 1972. And now it's unthinkable, right? Who could imagine a 10 lane highway going through Brooklyn and all the way up, basically wherever you see that red line, imagine a 10 lane highway, you, you know, cutting off neighborhoods and, and creating these eyesores. So uh, it really is a, a remarkable story of an interracial cross-class 
um, multi-region movement that was successful, even with even without the vote. Well, Chris, it has been my my pleasure. It has been my pleasure. I could listen to you probably all day long. I do want to just before I end, we had several questions about the painting behind you. So really, really quickly, let's give a shout out to that artist and tell the the background sure. with that painting because we got several questions about that painting behind you. <laughs> so I I had to go to my office because I was afraid my kids would would make too much noise if I tried this at home. So I, I run an organization called the Capital Area New Mainers Project. We work with immigrants who come to Central Maine. Uh, most of the ones who come here are from Iraq and Syria. And so we had a young woman named Zaina Ahmad. I'll move a little bit out of the way so you can see. And she painted this. It's called Home Lost and Home Found. So she painted her home in Syria, which unfortunately was destroyed by, by the war. And she made her way. And there's a, there's a river, the Kennebec River in Augusta, Maine. So the, crossing the, the uh, Kennebec River Bridge to... Augusta, the state capital, so that's the capital building. So, and there's a, a family, uh, an Arabic family, you know, having a picnic in the park. <clears throat> so she, she painted that, she's a high school student, she just graduated um, last year, but, uh, but yeah, so she painted that and let us, very generously let us, lets us hang it in the, in the office. We tell her over 250 people from the DC area uh, are very, very impressed with her work. I'm gonna now turn it over again, Chris. It has been my pleasure looking forward to working with you again in another capacity, but I thank you for putting all this, you and Derek, putting all this information together for a native Washingtonian such as myself who can go and say, yes, we do have a very rich and diverse history in Washington, DC. I'm gonna now turn it back over to Rock Creek Conservancy. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank Um, Elena, are you ready with the questions? All set. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ash. That was a really, really engaging talk, just like um, Kim Elder said. And we really appreciate you having here to um, share all this really rich DC history with us. Um, as everyone's been saying, we've been getting a lot of really great questions in the chat box. So I'm going to do my best to um, kind of combine thematically some of them and uh, get through as many as we can. Um, so to start, um, from Ed, what role do you see for Rock Creek Park and the Conservancy and other park partners in terms of addressing some of this history um, to make things more equitable? That's a great question. You know, I mean, it probably maybe <laughs> maybe you all in the Conservancy, you know, are, are better able to to determine that. Um, you know, I think I, I think it's such a magnificent resource. You know, anytime I used to work in Mississippi and I had this group called the Freedom Project, and, and we worked with middle and high school kids. And I often brought them to DC and the first place we would go is Rock Creek Park. Cause I'd drive them through and I'd say, look, you're actually in DC right now. And they couldn't believe that, that DC was so green. You know, there, there was so much park space. Um, but the truth of the matter, it's not just in DC, but it's all over, uh, you know, with the national parks and, and state parks, uh, poor folks and black folks often feel unwelcome there. You know, I remember I, I took some of my, the black kids I used to teach in Mississippi, we'd go camp, we did all these camping trips. And I remember somebody coming up to us and saying, oh, you know, who are all these kids? Are, are they in, uh, you know, some kind of reform program? Are they, you know, is this like a juvenile community service, you know, effort, you know, that, that they're working off their community service? They, like, they couldn't imagine that black kids would just be out camping because it's fun, right? Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's not, it's not just in DC, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nationwide issue. Um, and so it, it means you have to do more like, and, and you know, the, the channels are so deeply, deeply set, right? You know, that, that, that if you just let things go as they, as, you know, as nature takes them, the channels have already been dug, right? So it's going to take you in a certain direction and then you're gonna scratch your head and be like, well, gosh, I guess black people don't like nature. And that's just not true. Right. And so I think you have to you have to make aggressive efforts. I mean, that's where the term affirmative action first came from. Right. So you, in the 1960s era, like how do you uh, how do you redress long term injustice? Well, you have to take affirmative actions. You have to you have to go out of your way to make sure that people feel welcome. Right. And so some folks might say, well, gosh, that's racism or that's reverse. You know, you're doing too much or that's a special, you're making it seem like it's a special project. It is a special project because people went out of their way to create these conditions. Right. For all this talk about, well, you know, 
segregation is just natural. People want to live where, where, you know, next to people that look like them. That's just, history proves that wrong. If that were true, then why would Senator Newlands and all these developers, why would they work so hard to make their places exclusive, right? If people would just naturally segregate themselves, you wouldn't need all those laws. You wouldn't need those exclusive provisions. You wouldn't need restrictive covenants because people just wouldn't, wouldn't move to where they're not, you know, not comfortable. That's just not true, right? So throughout our history, people have made very aggressive actions to create inequalities and to create segregation. And so if we want to undo them, we have to take aggressive actions. You know, if, you know maybe that means, uh, you know, reaching out directly to schools, working with teachers and to, to bring classes there. Um, you know, I, I know a great organization called Live It, Learn It that takes uh, DC public schools to all kinds of, of local uh, history sites fantastic organization that, that is doing great work to really try to address precisely this kind of issue. Maybe Rock Creek Conservancy can work with them uh, or, you know, or other, other groups like that. But you, you really have to make it a priority and, and take aggressive action because it won't necessarily happen on its own. Just unmuting there. Um, great. I think that's a really, really important thing to note, the intentionality of that effort. Um, I think that's, yeah, crucial. Um, so to get to a couple more questions really fast. Um, let's see, where is that? Uh, Olivia asks, how can educators expose students um, to this really rich DC history and culture um, in terms of lesson plans, but also thinking outside of the classroom? Yes, well, I mentioned Live and Learn It, which is one of my favorite organizations in the, in the country because uh, they do what we, we used to do in the Freedom Project, which is experiential learning, right? Get the kids out of the classroom. I think it's so important. I mean, DC is a classroom, right? <laughs> There's so many places you can, you can go. And so I know it's very difficult within the, especially the public school system, you know, you gotta get buses, you gotta get permission, you know, like you gotta, there are lots of things that have to be in place. And so sometimes it can be hard. Teachers already have so much on their plates going on. Um, and that's why an organization like Live and Learn It works with teachers to help take a lot of the, the lesson planning and all that stuff off their shoulders and, and provides these, these great, these great experiential uh, opportunities for, for kids. It's just for fourth through six. But in general, I would say, uh, you know, get, get out of the classroom, uh, get the kids to see the, the, the city as, as a classroom. I know the DC Historical Society also does um, kind of history detective kind of programs where they can go into the archives uh, and read primary sources and sort of figure out these, these history mysteries. Uh, and, and those kinds of experiences are really important for kids to see that, that history is not just something you read about in the book, but, it, but you know, it's alive, it's out there, it, you know, it's, in the, it's in the streets. Um, and so you know, we've, we've actually been in conversation with, with folks at DCPS about using Chocolate City uh, as, as, a, as a textbook of sorts. Um, and I know the School Without Walls, uh, some of the classes there use it and, and other places, some of the charter schools have been using it as, a, as kind of a, a narrative history textbook. Um, because I think it's really, you know, we, we wrote it for that purpose. You know, we wrote it for people to be able to, uh, to understand and, and appreciate. We didn't want it to be, you know, like just in, in an archive, you know, for, for scholars to look at. Like we really wanted people, educators, students to, to be reading this history and, and engaging with it. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're going to have to transition to breakout rooms really fast, but I do want to ask um, one more very quick, maybe just a name and a sentence, um, your answer for this question from Destiny. Do you have a favorite person in DC history? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I did tell you about Sammy Abbott and Reginald Booker, which is, my, which is definitely my favorite story. Um, you know, and, and you know, Mary Church Terrell is great. Um, you know, and I tell the story of this guy, William Coston, um, who you know, challenged the, uh, the black codes and, and basically dared the city authorities to arrest him. And then they did. And, and he, he basically writes a manifesto, you know, 20 years before Thoreau, um, you know, in terms of civil disobedience. And he says, constitution knows no color, right? I mean, he's a century and a half ahead of his time. Uh, so he's another, another favorite. I could go on. There, there are lots of great, great books <laughs> in here. Um, Thanks, Elena, and, and thanks, Dr. Ash and, and Kim for that. That was truly fantastic. Um, I, I echo Kim's sentiments that we could listen to you talk all day. And I'll just note as well that I think it's really fitting that you 
gave this presentation on the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, because I think that idea of um, emancipation and full um, representation is, is so mixed in with everything that you just said. So if you haven't registered to vote yet, everybody, go do that. Um, so in just a moment, we are going to assign everyone to breakout rooms. You'll be manually assigned to a breakout room, and then about a moment after you get there, a facilitator from our fantastic partners at Link Strategic Partners will be there. This discussion is really meant to provide a foundation and a common knowledge as we start having these difficult conversations about what comes next and how we, how we, we don't repeat this conversation in the next 25 years, but rather are moving to a, a place where Rock Creek is really that place where people come together. So um, before we do that, um, I want to thank Dr. Ash for his wonderful comments. I know he's going to be sticking with us through those breakout rooms and we'll come back here at the end all together and just share some quick final um, Thanks and congratulations. Um, I will note there were a couple of questions in the chat box about purchasing Chocolate City. I'm sure Dr. Ash can share many ways to purchase it, but the one that he recommended to us is that you go to your favorite neighborhood um, uh, independent bookseller. So with that, thank you in advance, Link. I'm going to put everybody into breakout rooms and we'll see you back here at 625. Thank you.